Hello everyone and welcome to the first lecture of the ACG course. My name is Sharif Atouhi, I'm a lecturer of cardiology in Shams University and this is the first lecture that we are going to start our ACG course with and of course as this is the first lecture so it will be titled Basics of ECG. In this lecture we are just going to know what the meaning of the ECG, what are the uses of ECG, we will have some like an overview on the conductive system of the heart and we will understand how each lead of ECG can give me information. And after this, we are going in depth in each aspect or each category in the ECG, which we need to cover related to our clinical practice. So the first thing that we are going to start with our lecture is, what are the ILOs or the intended learning outcomes that you are going to have in this lecture? The first thing that you are going to review the conductive system of the heart in detail, as we said, we are going to understand the normal ECG waveforms and intervals. We are going to understand the different uses of ECG. We are going to understand the idea of the Eindhoven triangle, which is an important basic in the ECG in order to understand the axis. We are going to identify the types of ECG leads and the significance of each one. And we are going to know how to connect the ECG leads on the patient, because maybe it is the job of the nurse, but as a doctor, you need to know how to connect the ECG leads correctly, because sometimes you may correct after the nurse if she is any mess malposition in the ECG lead attachment, so you need to correct it. So the first thing that we are going to know, what is an ECG? ECG is standing for an electrogram, which represents the electrical events of the cardiac cycle. So ECG is related only to the electric electricity of the heart, not related to anything about the mechanical activity of the heart. Each event in the ECG has a distinctive waveform, and so it can be a way for us to understand the specific cardiac pathology in the patient. And if we want to know what is a complete scientific name, it is called 12-lead surface ECG. If we want to understand where each word comes from, so we can say that 12 comes from the number of leads that you will see in the ECG paper, which are 12 leads, 6 LAN leads, and 6 chest leads, or sometimes we call, we call them precorded leads. Surface ECG is related to the electrical activity recorded from the skin surface, because sometimes we have something called intracardiac ECG as during AP studies, or in ECG recorded from pacemakers. And sometimes we may be confused between two words, ECG or AKG. Is there any difference between ECG or AKG or the understanding for the same thing? The idea is it depends whether you prefer British or American way, because ECG is used in the British well, language and AKG is used in the American language. So if you are in the United States, you will see it AKG. And if you are in the UK, for example, you will say it as ECG. What are the uses of the ECG? It depends on the pathologies that you can detect from ECGs. First thing of all, of course, is that we can detect tachyarrhythmia and bradyarrhythmia from ECG. And of course, the ECG during palpitation or during an episode of syncope is the most important thing that can direct us to know what is the main arrhythmia that may be causing the cardiac syncope in this patient. Whereas the ECG, of course, may be helpful for us in some times, and this will go through this topic in other lectures. So the first thing that we can detect from ECG is arrhythmias. Second thing, of course, is the myocardial ischemia and infarction. And as we know that any patient having chest pain, if we, even if you are considering this pain as atypical, we need to have an ECG because it can give us a lot of information that can direct us to just CCU admission or can direct us to going directly to the cath lab or giving thrombolytic according to setting available in our hospital. Third thing, it can give an idea about chamber hypertrophy and dilatation related to atrial enlargement, ventricular hypertrophy, as we are going to say in uh, subsequent lectures. It can give us an idea about how to diagnose pericarditis because pericarditis can be diagnosed from ECG features as we are going to say after this. Electrolyte disturbance sometimes have some ECG manifestations that may help us to check the laboratory tests for these electrolytes if we are suspecting from the ECG that there is a problem like hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. Drug toxicity, of course, also have some features in the ECG, like, for example, digoxin toxicity, and the intake of QT prolonging drugs may lead to significant enlargement in the QT interval, which may increase risk of ventricular tachycardia and even VF and sudden cardiac arrest, and so the ECG is helpful for us in these cases. 
Features suggestive of structural heart disease sometimes may appear in ECG. The diagnosis of structural heart disease, of course, the cornerstone is echocardiography as the first imaging modality that you can use, but ECG features sometimes can give us a clue whether this patient is suspicious of having a structural heart disease and so echocardiography is a must or not. Now we are going to have like an overview about the conductive system of the heart. We all know this conductive system of the heart since physiology learning, but we are going to speak about the main items of the conductive system that we need to be oriented about. Of course, we know that the rhythm of the heart around arise from the sinoatrial node, or we call it SA node, which is present in the right atrium as a junction of SBC with the right atrium. And we need to know that SA node is a sub-epicardial structure, so it is more nearer to the epicardium rather than to the endocardium. The SA nodes has many fibers arising from it in order to deliver the impulse to the right atrium and left atrium and after this to reach the ventricles. So we have something called anterior internodal tract, middle internodal tract and posterior internodal tract which transmits impulse throughout the right atrium in order to reach the other station or gate which is AV node. And also we have something called Pacman's bundle. Pacman's bundle is an important terminology that we need to know because it is a bundle responsible for transmission of electricity from right atrium to left atrium through the intra septum, and that's the reason that right atrium and left atrium are depolarized. To be accurate, left atrium is slightly depolarized after the right atrium, but in the ECG we will see the atrial repolarization in the ECG which represents simultaneous depolarization of right and left atrium, even if left atrium is slightly delayed after the right atrium. After this, we have, of course, the AV node that we all know. AV node is a structure that is present in the right atrium, okay, which is sub in a cardiac structure, and that's why it is very near to the catheters when we are doing an epistadia and liable, for example, to iatrogenic block. The AV node is like the structure that transmits the electricity from the atrium to the ventricle, and from the AV node, we have something called the His bundle. His bundle is a structure that penetrates the AV ring, and it is the only electrical connection between the atrium and ventricle because there is something called fibrous AV ring that represents like an electrical insulator between the atria and the ventricles, and the His bundle is the only electrical pathway for the impulse to be transmit to transmit the electrical activity from the atrium to the ventricle in normal hearts. From the his bundle, we have two structures called right bundle branch block and left bundle branch. I'm sorry, right bundle branch and left bundle branch, as the his bundle bifurcates into two branches. Each branch is responsible for depolarization of its subsequent ventricle. So, for example, left bundle branch is responsible for left ventricular depolarization, and right bundle branch is responsible for right ventricular depolarization. And after this, each bundle branch bifurcates to multiple and multiple branches that makes like a network of conductive fibers, which are called the Purkinje fibers. So this is an overview about the conductive system of the heart. We need also to know that the left bundle is not just a structure that bifurcates directly into the different branch of the Purkinje network. No, it bifurcates as well to two other branches, which are called the left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle. They are still present in the left ventricle. And so the left anterior fascicle is the anterior branch of the left bundle and left posterior fascicle is the posterior branch of the left bundle branch. We were going, going to know the clinical significance of these fascicles as we are going to cover them in the lecture called interventricular conduction disturbance because sometimes abnormality in these fascicles may lead to ECG features. Now we are going to know what does each electrogram in the ECG represents. For example, the P wave, of course, we know the P wave. P wave represents the atrial depolarization, as we all know from the first a year in the faculty that first uh, atrial depolarization is the first event in the electrical cycle of the heart and so P wave is representative of the atrial depolarization. After this we have the complex which is responsible or represents I'm sorry the ventricular depolarization and after this we have the T wave which is representing the ventricular repolarization. So if we're going to now re uh, revise again, we have the atrial depolarization, which is the first thing in the, it, uh, of the, in the electrical cycle of the heart and is represented by the P wave. We have the ventricular repolar depolarization, which is represented by the complex, and we have the T uh, ventricular repolarization, which is represented by the T wave. So these are simply, as simple as we can say, the significance of each waveform in the ECG. If we want to speak about much more details in the ECG, we all know the P 
wave. We all know the complex, or sometimes we call it the QRS complex, although we prefer the word complex because there is different nomenclature for the complex according to the positive and negative waves present in it. And you have the T wave. We have other things called the intervals or the segments in the ECG. For example, we have here something called the PR interval, which is from the start of the P wave to the start of the complex. We have something called the PR segment, which is from the end of P wave to the start of the complex. We have something called the SC segment from the end of the complex to the start of the T wave. We have the QT interval, which is from the start of the complex to the end of T wave. And of course, we don't need to forget that there is something called J point, which is the end point of the complex, which represents the junction between the complex and the ST segment. We are coming into more details about the significance of these intervals and segments in the lectures called ECG interpretation. Of course, we all have this question since the first year that if we have signal representing iterative depolarization and signals representing ventricular depolarization and ventricular repolarization respectively, where is the signal of atrial repolarization? We always have the same answer that the atrial repolarization is a low voltage event that is usually masked in the QRS complex. Now we are going to discuss what is the ECG paper or how does it look like. The ECG paper we know of course that it is formed of a graph paper. We have like large squares and small squares. The small square if we need to say that the longitudinal or the vertical axis represents the voltage or the amplitude of the waveform and the horizontal axis represents the duration in milliseconds. So for example this small square the length of the square represents one millimeter, which is the voltage of the signal, and the width of the square is the time represented in 0.04 second, or if we can need to say it in millisecond, it will be 40 milliseconds. Large square, of course, is five times the small square, and so its length represents five millimeter, and the duration represents 0.2 second or 200 milliseconds. So. Each signal we can have an assessment or measurement of its duration and also its amplitude or its voltage. And that's what we need to say that when we are commenting on an ECG, for example, we need to comment, for example, on the P wave amplitude or P wave duration, the complex amplitude, complex duration, the T wave amplitude, T wave duration. All of this has some clinical significance that we are going to discuss in subsequent lectures. But we need to know how to measure these signals according to the squares. And now we know the lengths or the duration and amplitude of the small square and of the large square. And so we can measure any signal in the ECG. We have something called in the ECG paper called usual standardization. A standardization, it gives us an important value about the, uh, like a caliper for the amplitude of the signal. So for example, if we have a standardization like this, we mean, mean that each large square represents five millimeter and so two squares represent 10 millimeter. If we have double standardization, so at the time we are going to say like larger complex because it will in stands for 20 millivolt and half standardization it means that the standardization represents 5 millivolt and so we are going to see lower voltage complex and we are going to discuss this as all, all as well in the lecture called ECG interpretation. We need to know that the ECG paper is a thermal paper and so it is not just an ordinary white paper, no. It is a thermal paper that it may turn blackish on prolonged exposure to sunlight and that's why when we are having ECG papers for a patient for example we don't need to leave them in a sunny place because at that time you can find the ECG paper after leaving it for many days that it turned blackish and the assessment of the ECG is very difficult. And so the signals that are seen in the ECG are not ink, they are thermal effect of the ECG machine. Lates can appear in a rectangular paper and rigid in four vertical groups for example and sometimes we can see that the ECG in other machine appear in a long narrow paper in series in some older machine. Of course, the type prefer of the ECG is the rectangular paper that arranges the ECG leads in four vertical groups because, of course, when we are following up as the same patient with different ECGs, at that time it is difficult for me to see the ECG in just one rectangular paper in which I can see the 12 leads rather than seeing the ECG in a long narrow paper in series. And so we have two patterns. This pattern is the long paper strip that we usually don't prefer, but sometimes you may be faced with a situation in the ER that you are seeing an ECG for a patient in this form. But the most preferred form is this long rectangular paper, which shows you three groups of vertical ECG leads. Now we are going to speak about 
another issue that sometimes it may be difficult for some doctors to understand but I want to say that this issue is very important especially for cardiologists if you want if you want to understand the issue of the ECG axis at the time you need to understand the Eindhoven triangle if you need to understand the ECG leads and how can ECG leads see the electrical activity of the heart or each lead how can it see the electrical activity of the heart you need to understand this we know that the ECG leads are electrodes which measures the difference in electrical potential between either two different points on the body at the time we are going to call them bipolar leads or one point in the body and a virtual reference point with zero potential located in the center of the heart and at some time we will call it unipolar leads. So we have bipolar leads and we have unipolar leads. And so this is the idea of the ECG lead. How can it measure the electrical activity of the heart? Of course, we know that we have three types of ECG leads. Sometimes we can simplify them into two types, which are six chest leads or precordial leads from V1 to V6 and six limb leads. The six limb leads, we divide them again to two groups or two subgroups, which are three standard bipolar limb leads, which is lead one, lead two, lead three, and three augmented unipolar limb leads, which are AVL, AVF, AVR. So the net result is we are having three ECG group, which are three bipolar limb leads, three unipolar limb leads, and six chest leads. The axis of each lead represents the view from which it looks at heart. And this is what we need to understand the Eithoven triangle so we can understand how can each lead see the heart or where it is seeing the heart from. So, for example, we need to understand an important uh, fact that if the electrical waveform of the heart is directed towards the positive pole of the heart lead, it will show a positive deflection. So I will see, show it again. For example, this electrical waveform is going toward the positive pole of the lead, so the signal on the ECG paper will be positive signal. And the opposite, that if the electrical waveform is directed away from the positive pole, so it is going towards the negative pole of the lead, it will show a negative deflection. The third possibility is that if the electrical waveform is perpendicular on the ECG, on the axis of the heart, so it is not directed directly to the positive pole and not towards the negative pole, it will show a biphasic wave as we see it. So this is the electrical waveform morphology when the axis, or sorry, I'm sorry, the electrical activity is perpendicular to the ECG axis. We have something called Eindhoven triangle, which were made by a scientist called Eindhoven that described how can we understands each lead is seeing the heart. He's shown this image which is showing three bipolar leads. Lead one which forms the base of the triangle and this is the positive pull towards the left arm and the negative pull towards the right arm. We have lead two which represents like one of the limbs of the triangle on the left side. It has its positive pull towards the left leg and negative pull towards the right arm. And we have the lead three which has the positive pull to direct, directed toward the left leg and the negative pull directed toward the left arm. Always we imagine the heart in the center of this triangle as we can see it here in order to understand what's the expected morphology of ECG waveform in each lead of them. So, as we said before, that we have standard bipolar limb leads, which were discussed before in this Eindhoven triangle, lead 1, lead 2, lead 3. So, if this is a morphology of Eindhoven triangle in a simplified form, so what are we going to do with this Eindhoven triangle in order to make a better understanding of the bipolar leads? We will make some slight deviation in these three limbs of the triangle in this way. Lead one will be downwards, lead two will be rightly to the right side, and lead three towards the left side. So we'll say it again. Lead one will be directed downward, lead two will be directed to the right side, and lead three will be directed to the left side. So we have now these three limb leads having their lines like intersecting at a central point here. Okay, as we see, and they have the same arrangement of the positive poles and negative poles as we said before. So the positive poles and negative poles are the same. For example, lead one has the same positive pole towards the left arm and negative pole towards the right arm. Lead two and lead three have their positive poles directed towards the left foot. So the poles are not changed, but only the position of the limb lead is changed. So now, we can say that if we want to check only the positive poles of the heart and ignore the negative poles of the heart, we will have this morphology. 
lead one has its positive pull toward the left arm and as we get it downward so we can say that if we will draw a circle like this its angle will be in degrees which will be zero degree lead two has its positive pull toward the left foot and as we move it slightly to the right it will be at plus 60 degree lead three has also its positive pull downwards directed toward left foot but it will be at 120 degrees and as we know that all the degrees in the lower half of this circle will be in positive signal and all the leads or all the measurements in the upper half of the circle will be in minus signals. So, of course, we may ask ourselves a question that if we are measuring the voltage difference between left arm, right arm and left leg using three standard limb leads, so why do we put an electrode as a right leg? We don't use right leg. We didn't mention the right leg in any one of the positive or negative poles of the three bipolar limb leads. The only simple answer is that it is used as an indifferent electrode, which we will need in order to have measurement of these three leads. We have something called indifferent electrode, which is a physical fact. Now we understand the idea of the three bipolar limb leads. We need to understand the idea of the unipolar limb leads. As we say, they are unipolar, so they are different measuring the electrical potential between a certain point on the body and a zero indifferent point which have zero potential. And that's why we call them unipolar, because they are not just bipolar leads measuring between two different electrical points. No, they are measuring one point to another indifferent or zero potential. So we have three limb leads, which are the AVL standing for the left arm, AVR standing for the right arm, and AVF standing for the left foot. And as we see here, we are not having a unipolar lead at the right foot. We are just having it in the left foot, left arm, and right arm. The letter A stands for augmented because sometimes if we have just the waveform of these leads, it may show that they have low voltage signals and that's why there is an augmentation of these signals in order to be apparent clearly on the ACG paper and that's why we call them augmented leads. So that's why we put a letter A at the start of this abbreviation. If we want to see how, where is each lead pointing at? We can see that ABL is pointing at the left arm and so its uh, degree at this point is minus 30 degree as we said that the upper half of the circle show degrees in minus and AVR is pointing towards the right arm and so its measurement in degrees is minus 150 degree and 150 degree I'm sorry and AVF is pointing, pointing towards the left foot and so its degree is plus 90 degree so this is the measurements or the positive poles of the unipolar limb leads so now we have these two images the image here is standing for the three bipolar limb leads as we shown there there how we ignored the negative poles of these limb leads and just shown them the positive poles of these three limb leads and where each one pointing at and here we have an image for the three unipolar limb leads avl avr and avf if we want to merge these two images together we will have finally this image We'll have here six limb leads. We have here lead one pointing at zero degree, AVL pointing at minus 30 degree, AVR pointing at minus 150 degree. We have lead two pointing at plus 60 degree, AVF pointing at plus 90 degree, and lead three pointing at plus 190 degree. So here we have the six limb lead in one image, showing us how they are seeing the heart and where the positive pull of each limb lead came from. So, if we can see here the relation of these limb leads in the heart, we can see that the limb lead sees the heart from a frontal plane. So, like for example, if they are seeing the heart, they are seeing the heart from a coronal section, seeing the front of the heart. And so, the direction of the electrical activity in the heart when it is coming here, for example, from the SA node, if we can imagine it, to the AV node and then to the ventricles, we can imagine how can the morphology of the waveform be on each limb lead according to the direction of the electrical activity and its relation to the positive pull to each one of these limb leads. And here he can draw the complete circle in order to understand why these numbers or where these numbers come from. So here, as we said, the upper half of the circle is a minus and the lower half in positive degrees. Now we are going to move to the chest or the precordial leads. We have, of course, six chest leads. We need to know where each chest lead is put. 
Of course, we have V1, or in some ECG nomenclatures, they call it C1, but usually we will say V1. V1 here is in the force intercostal space to the right side of the sternum. So it is in the right force intercostal space, just to the right side of the sternum. We have V2. V2 is in the force left intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum. We will ignore V3 just for a minute, and we will see that V4 is in the left fifth intercostal space in, at the mid-clavicular line. And so V3 will be midway between V4 and V2. V5 is in the, also the same space, but at anterior, inter, uh, anterior axillary line, and V6 in the same space, but it is in the mid-axillary line. So we have six chest leads, as we say, and now we understand the position of these six chest leads. So these are the leads that are put on the chest wall of the heart, of the patient, I'm sorry. And we have, of course, we know the limb leads, as we put here an electrode at the left arm, electrode at the right arm, electrode at the left leg, and of course we will put an indifferent electrode at the right leg. So we have the morphology of these six chest leads as we see here, and we will see here the morphology of the six limb leads. The chest leads see the heart from like a horizontal plane. If we can imagine, we can have like a transverse section in the patient seeing the heart from above. So if we see that the limb bleeds, see the heart from a frontal plane, like from the front surface of the heart or a coronal section, the chest lead sees the heart from a transverse section, so you are seeing them from above or like a bird view. We have V1 and V2, they are more seeing the septum, and so sometimes we call them the septal leads. V3 and V4 are seeing more the anterior wall of the heart or of the left ventricle, and so we call them sometimes anterior leads, and V5 and V6 seeing much more the lateral wall of the left ventricle, and so we call them the lateral leads. Sometimes we call all the leads anterior leads, but if we have like a meticulous or precise classification, we can use this nomenclature for them. So, as we see here, limb leads see the heart from a frontal plane, like a coronal section, and chest leads see the heart from a transverse section, like a, 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 a like an, a bird view, seeing the heart from above. So, as we see here, ECG limb leads in a coronal view, and chest leads in a transverse view. So, if we want to imagine how the leads see the heart here in this image, as we said, the anterior portion of the heart is seen by the limb leads. This is the inferior portion of the heart, which will, see, will be seen by some of the limb leads. And this is the lateral portion of the heart, which will be by the lateral leads, some of them in the limb leads and some of them in the chest leads. So finally, we can have the summary of the ECG leads that we have two groups of limb leads, three bipolar limb leads, three unipolar augmented limb leads, and we have, of course, six chest leads, which are considered, of course, unipolar, not bipolar leads. And this is how the ECG leads see them. So now we can see how the possible of each limb lead is directed toward. And so, according to this, we can understand what's the morphology of the waveform in each of these leads according to the pathology of the heart, or if we are speaking at a normal heart, we can imagine how the morphology will be. So, for example, here we can have a normal ECG like this. In this lead, we can see, for example, that there are positive complex in lead 1, lead 2, lead EVL, lead EVF, which are we see in most times. Lead AVR is always or almost always negative in normal hearts because, of course, as we know that AVR at, at the right arm and so the net electrical activity of the heart is directed away from it towards its negative pole and so AVR is almost always negative in normal ECGs. Lead 3 in sometimes we can see it biphasic because the electrical axis of normal heart is perpendicular to lead 3. And in the chest lead we see something called R-wave progression in which the R-wave starts small in V1 and then it tends to be bigger and bigger and bigger till we find here a very tall R wave and small S wave in V6 which we call R wave progression. This is another form of normal ECG in which we can see that there are positive complex in the five limb leads and of course we know that AVR is almost always negative in uh, normal hearts and we can see the R wave progression and this is another pattern in which we can see that there are positive complex in lead 1, 2, 3 and AVF AVL, AVR, I'm sorry, is almost always negative. Sometimes we can see AVL is negative, but if lead 1, 2, 3, and AVF are positive, so we are speaking about as well a normal axis of the heart, and of course, our wave progression that we discussed before. So, if we want to say how many numbers of electrodes we use during ECG, we use four limb electrodes and six chest electrodes. 
So they are totally 10 electrodes attached to the patient. As we can see, we have six chest leads attached to the anterior chest wall of the heart patient, and we have four limb leads to his four limbs. But the net result that we will get 12 ECG leads in the paper. So don't be confused that we are going to see 12 ECG leads in the paper, but we are using just 10 electrodes attached to the patient's scan. There is something called ECG strips that we need to know, of course, that we select a specific lead to print it from it, a long ECG strip, that sometimes if I am going to assess the rhythm of the heart, if there is some like rhythm abnormality in the patient, I need to have a long strip that in which I can study the P waves and the complex and the relationship in order to know if the patient has normal rhythm or not. Usually we select lead 2 or V1 because lead 2 and V1, we can see the complex clearly and also we can see the P wave clearly because they are the most clear leads to identify the P wave. It can usually be present at the bottom of the white ECG paper or sometimes if we are having an ECG paper like a long strip, we can have a long strip of paper up to 12, lead, 12 leads in a narrow, long narrow ECG paper. So for example, we can see here that we have an ECG strip for V1 like this and also we have an ECG strip for lead 2 like this. So in an ECG paper, you can see there are 12 ECG leads and you can find here the ECG strip, which is helpful for you in order to assess, for example, the rhythm abnormality. We are going to speak also about ECG connection because as we say that it may be job description of the nurse to have an ECG for the patient, but you need to know the normal attachment of the ECG because sometimes you may supervise on the nurse while she is doing an ECG in order to make sure whether the ECG is attached correctly or not. Of course, we have, we discussed before that we have six chest leads connection and four limb leads connection. So we have net result 10 connections, which will show me 12 ECG leads on the paper. They can have this morphology in which each one of these uh, leads have like an electrode or like a sticker that is attached above this lead in order to have measurement or transmission of the signal from the heart. Sometimes they are in this morphology in which we can see limb clamps like this attached to the four limbs of the patient and we can see six chest suction cup pulps that are put on the skin of the anterior chest wall of the patient and you just press on this ball of the cup in order to make like a suction of the skin. Sometimes these are the machine available in your CCU or in your ER, but sometimes some doctors don't prefer them because if a patient is having like bleeding tendency, it can lead like small hematomas at the place of the attachment. So some doctors prefer these type of ECG connections, but sometimes you will find that this is an available ECG machine as a place where we are working at. If we want to know the attachment of the ECG leads, we discussed how the chest leads are uh, attached to the chest wall according to the surface anatomy of the patient or the thoracic wall. We also have the attachment of the four limb electrodes, which as we said, will show us six ECG leads. But we need to know the arrangement usually of this machine. We have like four colors of the limb leads. We have yellow color, green color, red color, and black color. Usually we use like an arrangement for the colors like this, like here on the left side, we start by yellow for desert and then green for grass or for garden. And then we use the red here on the right arm, like for fire and the black for the net result after black. And of course, I know that many of you know this mnemonic. So if we want to make it like simple, we have on the left side, the yellows and green, which stand for deserts and garden. And we have on the right side, fire and then the like crash ashes after the fire on the left on the right foot. And sometimes some doctors try to make them make this in their mind that the always the right uh, red limb or lip, red limb electrode is on the right arm. So this is the usual arrangement of the limb leads. Also, I want you to remember that water and gel are good connectors for electricity. So always make sure that the ECG limb electrode is well attached to the skin of the patient. And if you find that there are many artifacts in the ECG paper, you need to know that there is not or there is poor connection between the electrode and the skin. So you need to use water or gel. And especially when you see artifacts or oscillations in the ECG, use a wet cotton or gel to make a good connection between the electrode surface and the skin. Also, there is of course, uh, common situations that you are having an ECG for a patient with an amputated limb as our upper limb or lower limb. How can we manage this according to the attachment of the chest leads? 
is not a big deal because you will put the electrode just proximal to the stump of the amputated limb. So for example, if we usually put the ECG limb leads or the limb electrodes at the side, for example, as the distal forearms and as the distal legs, in patient with amputated limb, you can put them, for example, here near the shoulder or near the thigh. So it is not a big problem if you need to move the limb electrodes more proximal if there is any problem like amputation or like a burn for example at the distal arm or distal leg you can move them proximal and they will give you the same information so we know these 12 leads and we need to know the arrangement of the leads on the ECG because we need to know how each lead is seeing the heart in order to know how each lead will give me an information about a certain pathology in a certain region of the heart for example, we know that V1 and V2 represent septal leads because they are more directed towards the interventricular septum. We know that Z3 and V4 are more directed towards the anterior wall of the LV. V5, V6 of the chest leads are looking at the lateral wall. Moreover, lead 1 and lead AVL, which are part of the limb leads, are seeing also the lateral wall of the heart. So we call these four leads the lateral leads. And of course, we know that 2, 3, and AVF are the inferior leads because they are seeing much more the inferior wall of the heart. So this is a summary of the lead, how each lead is seeing the heart. Of course, this will be of much great importance for us in identifying myocardial ischemia and trying to localize where the myocardial ischemia is. So if we want to put this on the ECG paper, it will be like this and as we see here that there is something called the ECG strips that we discussed before that it has a long ECG printed paper showing me the rhythm of the heart clearly. So we came to the end of this lecture which is the ECG basics and we want to revise what we now understand after we discuss this. We understand now the conduction system of the heart we can understand the uses of the ECG as we discussed before we know the normal ECG waveforms and intervals and we know the Eindhoven triangle and how it formulated the arrangement of the ECG leads that we can see now in most ECG books. And we know the types of the ECG leads. And of course, we know how to connect ECG to the patient. Thank you very much for your listening. And of course, we will have much more lectures about other aspects of the ECG. Thank you.